Alright, this video is going to cover a hypothesis test for the difference between two sample proportions. So we're talking about two completely separate proportions, not a match pair, anything like that. Two completely separate proportions taken from two populations, and we want to basically see is there a difference between them. So the general idea here is we have two sample proportions, and we want to know is there really a difference between these two samples, or is it just natural variation? Maybe there really is no difference, we're just seeing a difference. Because you have to understand the most important thing is that anytime you look at two samples, there's going to be a difference between them. You just have to determine is that difference significant or not. And that's what we're going to learn about. Now, the cool thing is we already should know the steps to our hypothesis test. So step one is that you're going to create your hypothesis. The null is always a negative statement. So there will be no difference between the two populations. That's going to be your, your um, null. The alternative is that, well, there is a difference. So let's write out how we would show this. So our null would be that there is no difference. That means that the proportion from sample one equals the proportion from sample two. And the alternative, because let me explain that one more time. Now, remember, if there is no difference, then they're equal, right? So that's what we're saying. There is no difference. Another way we could write that if we really wanted to is that the difference, right, subtraction, is equal to zero, meaning there is no difference. But if you add P2 over, you get P1 equals P2. And the alternative would be that there is a difference. Now, you have to read the problem to know which direction. Are we stating that... Um, population 1 is greater than population 2, or uh, maybe we want to say that population 1 is less than population 2, or maybe we just care that there's a difference. We don't really care which one's higher or which one's lower. We just care that there's a difference. So you've got to read the problem to understand what that alternative is. Now, don't forget, you also want to say what P1 and P2 is. So, P1 is the proportion of Americans that are illiterate, and P2 is the proportion of Canadians that are illiterate. And we assume that the, you know, the illiteracy levels are the same between the two, and then our alternative is that one is greater than the other or that they're just not equal to each other. All right, step two is our conditions. The good news is these conditions are all sound very familiar, but you do have to check the conditions for both samples. So condition number one, both samples must be selected randomly. Condition number two, both samples must be less than 10% of their respective populations. Number three, both samples must have 10 successes and 10 failures. So it's actually four numbers you got to check, successes and failures in both samples. And then don't forget when you're working with um, two samples, you do have to have a fourth condition that the two samples must be independent of each other, which means that they, well, the outcome of one does not affect the outcome of the other. And that should always be true, but we do have to state it. All right, step three is, of course, your work to find the p-value. Here you will need an observed difference between your two samples. That's what's the most important value is, what difference did you observe? Because remember, we assume that there's no difference, and then we want to find out what difference we observe. Now, we do want to find a standard error. Now, <coughs> remember that we talked about in, in, the, in the other videos for intervals to find the standard error for the difference between two samples, right? To find the standard error for the difference between two samples, you take, um, you know, you take the standard error for the first, which is p hat q hat divided by n giant square root, and then you take uh, square root of p hat q hat divided by n for your second sample. So I'll put some twos on those and some ones on these so that we understand the difference between both samples. But remember, we're not allowed to add standard deviations, so we have to square both of these guys first, which makes that square root go away. Then we have to add together. And then we put a giant square root around all of that combined variance. So that's why we kind of clean up that formula and said that's going to be p hat 1, q hat 1, divided by sample size 1, plus p hat 2, q hat 2, divided by sample size 2. Now, this is what I taught you to do work with intervals, and this is how you find the standard error of a difference. But, there's an extra tricky thing <coughs> that happens in one of these hypothesis tests, and that is that, remember, our null is that we're assuming there is absolutely no difference. <coughs> so, in one of these problems, we actually want to pull everybody together. We want to assume that everybody's the same, right? Well, if there is no difference, then why are we creating two different samples? Let's just put everybody together. And that's how we're going to find centered error, and we will show that once we do an, an example. Now, you only have to do this in hypothesis tests. You don't have to do this in an interval. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. 
All right. Now, step four is, of course, to make our conclusion. Your conclusion is going to be one of two things. If your p-value is above alpha, well, we fail to reject the null. This means that there's no significant evidence to go with the alternative. Basically, what we're saying here is, yes, we might have witnessed a uh, difference, but it's not big enough for, there to, for me to say that there truly is a difference, okay? So there's just not enough significant evidence to go with the alternative when your alpha is above or when your p-value is above alpha. When your p-value is less than alpha, that's when we reject an all, and we say, wow, this is significant evidence to take on the alternative. And when we reject an all, we're saying, well, no, there really is a difference between these two values. There is a significant difference. All right, so let's look at an example here to fully understand how to do one of these problems, and I think all the pieces will come together and you'll really understand it. So here's our question. Here is our problem for the video. Is there a difference between the proportions of students at Wilcox School that don't eat breakfast every morning and the students at Bissell School that don't eat breakfast? So we have two totally different schools, Wilcox and Bissell, and we want to know is there a difference between the proportions of kids that don't eat breakfast at these two schools? So we're going to take a simple random sample of 80 students at Wilcox and 19 don't eat breakfast. And then we're going to go to Bissell. We're going to take a simple random sample of 150 students and 26 don't eat breakfast. Now, most kids say, well, why are you taking different sample sizes? I mean, you're right. I did that on purpose only, only to show you that you don't have to have the same sample sizes. It all comes down to the proportion, not the number of. So our question here, is this data evidence of a difference? Is there really a difference between Bissell School and Wilcox School when it comes to the proportion of kids that don't eat breakfast? So let's go ahead and get started with the problem. All right, step one is the hypothesis. So our null hypothesis, remember, is always a negative statement that there is no difference. That means the proportion of people at Wilcox that don't eat breakfast is equal to the proportion of kids at Bissell that don't eat breakfast. Now, notice I'm using a W and a B. I'm trying to personalize the problem a little bit using Wilcox and Bissell rather than just generic ones and twos. Now, the alternative, well, if we go back to the problem, if you need to go back to it, it never says that we think Wilcox is higher or Bissell is higher or that Wilcox is lower. All it says is, is there a difference? So our alternative is going to be that there is a difference between the proportion of Wilcox and the proportion of Bissell. So the not equal to sign is just saying that there is a difference. There is a difference between these two schools. And remember, our change is that at the very, very end, we need to double our p-value. Now, I do need to talk about what pw and pb is. And uh, this is the proportion and I'm spelling that completely wrong, had Wilcox School, and this is the proportion at Bissell School. And again, this is the proportion of students that do not eat breakfast. Okay, so let's just run through the conditions real quick. And I'm not trying to, um, you know, fly through the conditions, but just for sake of making the video shorter. Condition number one is that both samples must be done randomly. It did say they were both simple random samples. Both samples, the 80 and the 150, must be less than 10% of all the students at the school. And since I don't know how many students at the school, I just have to assume that to be true. Um, the one said I had 19 kids that didn't eat breakfast, and that was of 80 kids, right? So there's 80 kids that don't eat breakfast. 80 minus 19 is 61 who do eat breakfast. Both are bigger than 10. The other school had 26 kids that don't eat breakfast, and that was out of 150. So 150 minus 26 is 124 kids that do eat breakfast. So all of those numbers are bigger than 10, so I'm good to go for the normal model. And then don't forget that fourth condition, and that the two samples have to be independent of each other, which means, you know, if a kid eats uh, breakfast at Wilcox or doesn't eat breakfast at Wilcox, that will not impact a kid at Bissell. And that should be true. I don't see why it wouldn't. Okay, so um, step three now is the work, all right? The work is going to center around these two values. This is our sample value, p hat. This is our sample at Wilcox, 19 out of 80 kids that don't eat breakfast. That's 23.75%, 0.2375. And then this we have is our sample proportion. That's why I have the little hat that this is our sample proportion at Bissell, 26 out of 150 kids that don't eat breakfast, 0.1733. Now, the first thing I need is an observed difference. Now, what difference did I observe? Well, um, we're just going to subtract these two numbers. And we typically want positive numbers just because they're, uh, they kind of make more sense to work with. But it really doesn't matter the order you subtract these. I'm going to do 0.2375 minus 0.1733. 
And now uh, this tells me that there, according to our data, there is a difference of, whoop, I almost messed that up, 0 0.0642. So that just keep in mind that that is in favor of Wilcox. Wilcox is higher. But remember, I don't really care who's higher. I'm just caring that there's a difference. Now, the other thing I need to think about is my standard error. And this is where I told you that this is really kind of something different, kind of new. So I'm going to star this. To find my standard error, I have to do what's called pooling. Remember, the idea is that I'm assuming that there is no difference. So if there really is no difference, why am I looking at the two different schools? Why don't I just put all these kids together? So we get what we call P hat pooled. All this is doing is taking the 150 and the 80 kids and putting them together. So I'm putting all the kids together. So I'm saying there's 230 total kids. And 19 plus 26 would be my total of 45 kids who don't eat breakfast, right? If there's no difference between Wilcox and Bissell, which is what I'm assuming in a hypothesis test, why treat them separately? Just put them all together. So 45 out of 230 is 0.1957. 1957. This is what we call our P hat pool. This is putting all the kids together because really, right, the null, it doesn't really matter what school you go to. And I'm going to use this number to find my standard error pooled. Okay, so here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to take a giant square root. Now I'm going to take P hat pool, 0.1957, and I'm going to multiply that. Or I'm going to multiply that by Q hat pool, which is just 1 minus 0.1957. So if 19.57% of kids don't eat breakfast, then that means that 80.43 or 0.8043 do. And I divide that by the 80 kids at Wilcox. I'm sorry, yeah, at Wilcox. Plus, and I'm going to use those same numbers, 0 0.1957 times 0 0.8043 divided by 150 kids at Wilcox. Now, here's the idea. If there is no difference between these 80 kids and these 150 kids, then shouldn't the numbers all be the same? Shouldn't we just throw them all together? And that's where I got that P hat pulled from. So I'm using the same numbers on top because remember, the null is that everybody's the same. So it shouldn't matter if I'm at the 80 kids at Wilcox, 150 kids at Bissell, they're all the same. So on my calculator, I'm going to get a giant square root. And then inside that square root, I have a first set of parentheses, 0.1957 times 0 0.8043 divided by the 80 kids at um, Wilcox, plus another set of parentheses, 0 0.1957 times 0 0.8043 divided by the 150 kids at Bissell, and um, put all that together, and I get a standard error pooled of 0 0.0549. 0.0549. Okay, now here's the idea. Here's where I'm coming to the final value. I want to find my z-score, right? How weird is this difference? So 0 0.0642 minus 0. Why 0? Because remember, I assume there was no difference. So I want to see. I witnessed these difference of 0 0.0642. How far away is that from my null that there was no difference whatsoever? And I'm going to divide by the standard error, 0.0549. Remember, I built that standard error based on the idea that there was no difference. So I get 0.0642 divided by 0.0549. That's pretty obvious there. So 0.0642 divided by 0.0549. And I get 1.1694. 1 1.1694. Now to find my p-value. Okay, so what happens was that this was a higher number, right? It was a positive number. So my p-value is going to look above that z-score. So I'm going to grab a normal CDF, 1.1694 to 99, and I get 0 0.1211. But because I only care about a difference, I don't care that Wilcox is higher or that Bissell is higher, then that means I am actually want to double this. I want to look at both tails, the upper tail and the bottom tail, which would be equal because of symmetry. So I'm going to double that, and I get 0.2422. So that is my p-value. And by the way, hopefully you recognize that as an extremely high p-value. So my last step is my conclusion. And with a large p-value, with a p-value um, that large, 0.2422, that's definitely greater than any alpha value we use, whether we use 0.05 or 0.01, it's definitely a big value. So this means I will fail to reject the null. Now I want to give a little context to this. There is no evidence of a difference 
in the proportion of students who don't Come along here, but I'm just using the words from the problem. There's no evidence of a difference in the proportion of students who don't eat breakfast at the two schools. So yes, we saw a difference in our samples, but you know what? It's probably just natural variation. I probably saw a difference just because, you know what? Everything varies. I didn't see a statistically significant difference. I didn't see anything of major concern that would tell me that kids at Wilcox or kids at Bissell are more or less likely to eat to eat breakfast. So no difference here, and that's based on my p-value. Hopefully the tricky part of this is understanding that since my null is that there is no difference, I have to do what's this called p-hat pooling. You do not pool in a confidence interval. As conference intervals have no assumptions of anything, you're just trying to find what you think the difference is. So keep that in mind here. Hopefully this video made sense. We'll talk a lot more about it in class.